as we talked last week, um, that you see in this in, in Romans one, you see two revelations from God. You see first the revelation of the gospel, verses sixteen and seventeen, um, the revelation of God's righteousness, and it is God's righteousness, right? Um, and so you see. Um, the revelation of that in verses 16 and 17. And then verse 18, as we were just starting last week, um, we see the revelation of God's wrath. Right? For those who practice unrighteousness and ungodliness. So, two revelations. There's a contrast that Paul is drawing. Starting with his commitment, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, Contrasted with the wrath that is due to mankind. So we talked about that last week. Um, And because of all men being sinful, which is what Paul, it's what we're in, right? It's This is all Gentiles, and then Paul's going to turn, he's going to pivot and make the argument to the Jews. Because all Gentiles and all Jews are sinful. Because all mankind is sinful, we need God's righteousness. We are dead in sin apart from the righteousness of God. And it is the righteousness of God that is revealed through the Gospel. Okay? Um, So, we're going to start with, we're going to get rolling into it. If you'll look at um, verse 18, it's Roman numeral 3 on your outline. And I included those first couple verses. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they, so we, are without excuse. Okay? So they are without excuse. And so we want to start with this idea of God's wrath. That's a big kind of idea. We talked about last week, this is this is kind of a downer, this section. And it I would argue it kind of appears to be to be that way to Paul. In fact, that Paul will stop, he'll pause for a second. Uh, we'll get to that here in a little bit. But so first of all, God's wrath. Important for us to recognize. God's wrath is from who? It's from God. Therefore, God's wrath is holy. Because God is infinitely holy. God's wrath is holy because God is infinitely holy. Exodus 15.11 Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, Awesome and glorious deeds, doing wonders. For Samuel 2 2, there is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you, there is no rock like our God. Revelation 15 4, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. And we have this word. The word is trihagion or trishagion. Um, It's either T-R-I-S-A-G-I-O-N or T-R-I-H. It just depends on which group you talk about. But what it means, it's the use of the holy, holy, holy that we see in Scripture. In Isaiah, we see it in Revelation. The trihagion or the trishagion. Okay, the trishagion. Um, so uh, this idea that God is holy, holy, holy is the idea that God is thrice holy. In other words, God is immeasurably holy. He is infinitely holy. Um, some suggest that this may be spoken about the Trinity, right? That God the Father is holy. Jesus the Son is holy, and the Holy Spirit is holy. That's certainly a possibility. Um, Although, for example, when you see, and by the way, because of the Trinity, it is true, regardless of whether or not that's why they say holy, holy, holy. Does that make sense? Um, 
But when we see in Revelation, for example, God the Father is proclaimed as holy, holy, holy in the throne room. So I would actually make the argument that this is a statement about the, in, the infinitude of God's holiness. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so again, we see this in Isaiah 6, 3. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Man, just ponder that for a second. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. I would deeply encourage you to go read Revelation 4 and 5. The throne room of God. Um, I was incredibly moved. Uh, uh, I, I, I listened to, when I preach, I listened to the words of my, my friend Shane. Uh, Pastor Shane says, make sure that always that um, you're preaching to yourself, you're not listening to yourself. Right? And uh, when, I, uh, when I was given the opportunity to really dive deep into the throne room of God a few years ago, um, it, it incredibly altered my heart. To see the, mi the mightiness and the majesty of God. To see John, the Apostle John, in, in um, Revelation 5, falling to his knees and crying, woe is me, because there's no one to open the book that is you know, to break the seals. That is the, the beginning of the end, so to speak. Except for Jesus. And there is Jesus. And again, holy, holy, holy. Incredible. Kevin? Um, yeah. Uh, just, a, just parenthetically. So, in your being brought into the holy, holy, holy. Then what did that mean and how did that ripple out in in your life too. Man, that's a big question. Um, so the first thing that it did is it made me, um, much like the Apostle John, desire to fall to my face before God. To recognize that God is God, Gary, and I am absolutely not. And and really to be penitent about the, the areas of my life that I still wanted to keep control of. To recognize that God is God, um, and we're not. That was the very first thing, um, and and I would argue it is that it is that mentality um, that I think is so important. That we have this bless you, that we have this high view of who God the Father is. That when we say holy, again, what does the word holy mean? Separate, set apart. God is set apart. And we'll talk about what that means. There, there's some and if you know conditions here that occur because of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that was the other thing, Gary, is it made me really worship um, uh, Jesus and His act on the cross that allows us to then be in the throne room of God, where we can then praise God the Father. Um, in His holiness. And I was really moved, Gary, that the 24 elders that we read about in Revelation 4, um, what do they do? Fall down. They fall down and they throw their crowns before the throne. Like sometimes, like there's that, and I don't want to get too like, I don't want to go there too, too much. Let me just be very clear. But there's that song that we sometimes sing, and it's a beautiful song. And it does make us think about what we're like. What will we be like when we come in the presence of God the Father? Um, and it, it says, you know, will we dance for you, Jesus, or in awe, will we be still? Well, I don't know, obviously. I haven't been there yet. But I can tell you what people in the Bible have done. And they will do what the 24 elders do, right? We will throw our crowns on the ground before God. Now, I'm just going to tell you, I think that that is a barrier to people in, in coming to faith. I, I, don't think, I don't think it's a great, um, how, how can I say this? I don't, I don't think it's a, it sounds like a real desirous thing that for eternity, I will worship God. I don't. And I think we all fall prey to like, Man, I sure hope Jesus comes back, but 
hopefully he'll wait till I get married, or hopefully he'll wait till this or that, or <laughs> my grandbaby's born, or uh, do you realize what we're going to do for eternity? We will live the way we were designed to live, to honor and to glorify God. Amen. What a precious thing that is. And you know what? There's a reason why. And it gets to the very thing that we're talking about today. The reason why that's not very desirous to people? They're not truly saved. Because they're, yeah, exactly. They, they are people who are depraved. They are stuck in their depravity. They're dead in their sins. Apart from grace that God gives, we would be in the same place. You don't get it until you're saved. Exactly. And, I, and so, yes, that's true of them. Um, but that's what we should expect. Right? We don't want to serve God before, before we're saved. We want to serve ourselves. And so, Gary, as I think about that, that's what I come to, is the effect that it has on my heart um, as I'm studying the throne room of God. It's, um, it's that high view of God and what it means to me. Yeah. One observation. <clears throat> And that is that um, a spin off from that, Brother Kevin, might well be a successful history teacher, a successful coach, closer to midlife than early life. Amen. Uh, <laughs> choosing to leave that realm of success to enter in as our assistant. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Praise God. Did you have something to well, say too? Yeah, I just felt like I attacked what you were saying a, a little while ago about, you know, certainly want <clears throat> the American church to be the church. But having been in other countries where they have absolutely nothing, <coughs> they can be spiritually enriching people like us who want to delay Christ coming. Yeah, you're right. You know, and that's why I say, send them over here. Let let it be their missionary work to touch us with Amen. their simplicity. And Amen. Working with a young man in Uganda who is helping keep alive 250 orphans. Mm -hmm. You know, he and two other people. Yeah. No, and 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 I want to be clear. I think you're exactly right. I think I think it's infusing to us in a lot of ways, right? It infuses our heart. It infuses our spirit when others come. Um, the absolutely. Is, the U.S. is not God's own kingdom. Uh, no. <laughs> no. no. We, we would do well to remember that. If we think we're the going out yeah. to the world, and shame on us because we're not saving the world. Yes, we yeah. have a part of it, but we're not it. Yes. Yes. Alone. We would do well to remember that. Yeah. Tim Hall is one of the missionaries we support. He always says, to encourages has encouraged us as a missions committee to pray that our church will be world Christians, not American Christians. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. I absolutely agree. Yeah. Yep, absolutely agree. That's well said. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, moving on here. Uh, by the way, I do want you to notice that when we talk about the idea that God is thrice holy, I want you to see that there is continuity between the Old and New Testament. Right? Isaiah comes before God in the throne room, holy, holy, holy. John comes before God in the throne room, and again we hear holy, holy, holy. What tremendous continuity there is. Um, Hodge said this, and this is not the Hodge. We all know this is A.A. Hodge. I can't tell you what the A stands for. But, um, the holiness of God is not conceived as one attribute among others. We, we fall in danger of this. I'm a huge fan. Um, and of course, I'm going to... Gary, who's the, what's the book you guys have been studying? Um, Tozer. Yeah. Yes, Pursuit of God. And, and the knowledge, the right? Yep, knowledge of the Holy. Huge fan of Tozer. Um, and he does a remarkable job. If you've never read Knowledge of the Holy, please go buy a copy or... Talk to Gary, probably has 19 of them. Uh, I like, it is an incredible book. Um, you can, by the way, find it for free, a PDF for it, free online also. Um, incredible book. I would encourage you, if you've never read that book, I mean, you can read a chapter that is on an attribute of God 
it's like what three four pages you read in just a few minutes I mean, cakes, man. yeah it's it's incredible i think though and not that tozer does this but i think when we study it that way we tend to think about individual attributes of god and i love this quote by hodge the holiness of god is not to be conceived as one attribute among others it is rather a general term representing the concept of God's consummate perfection in total glory. It is His infinite moral perfection crowning His infinite intelligence and power. His infinite moral perfection is the crown of the Godhead. Holiness is God's total glory crowned. It is the ultimate of God. And we shared this, we shared, I shared some from Thomas Watson with you last week. Um, Watson says this, Holiness is the most sparkling jewel of His crown. It is the name by which God is known. The name by which God is known. MacArthur says, Holiness is the primary description of God because no other attribute of God is ever repeated three times. Nowhere does it say he is love, love, love. Wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. But it does say he is holy, holy, holy. Therefore, if God is holy, if God is infinitely holy, God's wrath is also divine and holy. And we talked about last week, these, uh, these guys, Watson and Nigren and... Um, that God has to because of His holiness. Has to smash sin because of His holiness. Hebrew, or I'm sorry, Habakkuk. That's why well, I should wear my reading glasses. <laughs> Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13a says, You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. God is holy. And therefore God's wrath is holy. I think it's important that we pause for a second and we talk about this idea. Mankind has often tried to impose our view of what God's wrath should look like, our view of when God should apply wrath. We've tried to take what we think is right and apply that to holy God. Which, by the way, when we come right down to it, is just simply idolatry. Isn't it? God, you don't know what you're doing. And I know what I'm doing. And you should do what I think is right. That's idolatry. Greek philosophy taught that God's wrath was incompatible with an enlightened view of God. Does that sound familiar today? And we have whole groups in the church now who don't even believe that hell exists. How can you believe in a holy God without the existence of hell? God believes in hell. Yeah, yeah, Jesus sure talked about it a lot. Yeah, amen. The enlightened deist view of God. By the way, um, don't let anyone kid you. you. You hear this stuff about America's founding fathers. American founding fa America's founding fathers were overwhelmingly deist. In other words, they believe that there's a God out there, but that God is not deeply involved in our lives. I mean, Thomas Jefferson is, an, is a product of the Enlightenment. Cut the miracles out of the Bible. Rewrote it. You can go see it. You can go see it. He, he believed that that kind of stuff didn't mesh with man's ability to understand it. That's the Enlightenment. It's not actually that hard to go find. And now we, we've got people trying to return. Oh, that's not true. Well, listen, you can go see it. Go to Monticello. Go see the Jefferson Bible. Cut the miracles out. I don't know why you would want that without the miracles. Because that, there's one miracle that's pretty important to us, I think. <laughs> the enlightened deist view of God is similar. Wrath is simply the consequence of a moral world, sometimes bad decisions. So if like you commit murder, that's a bad decision. Therefore, you get wrath. That is not a biblical view of wrath. Both of those things are man-made. 
I want you to, if, if I don't have this in your notes, the word humanism, write it down for me. Humanism, at its very core, is the elevation of man. The, that's what it is. And by the way, when you do like a broad scope of modern world history, in other words, since Christ, let's say, when you look at the Renaissance, that's how the Renaissance starts. It's an elevating of the view of mankind. The reason why you have like the, uh, the great paintings and the, the sculptures like of David, they're still biblical figures, but what are they doing? They're elevating humanity. And then you take it a step farther from the Renaissance. You get into the scientific revolution and the ideas of the Enlightenment. And then today, we're into... Uh, an, an, a period where now in this postmodern world it's not mankind generally it's you personally like you get to have your own truth so for example if you believe that you should be a different gender then that makes it true if you believe that what you've chosen fear I, I mean listen on Facebook um, this is now old information so I apologize I can't keep up with it fast enough but uh, uh, two years ago, you could choose 52 different identities. Different genders. Yeah, different gender identities. I think in uh, some applications for employment in the state of Georgia, you're given 12 choices of gender at one point. I mean, that's the direction we've gone. It's incredible. Uh, but why? Well, of course that's the direction we've gone. We have a postmodern world where you are the determiner of truth. In a postmodern world, of course that's going to happen. Because whether we like it or not, like our country is a product. Our, the existence of our style of government is a product. We, we teach this at the high school. Government, chapter 2 book, in the, in the Magruder's textbook, chapter 2. What the ideas of democracy are based on. They are based on the Enlightenment. They are based on the ideas coming out of the, um, the Renaissance and the scientific revolution. They're based on those things. It is based on humanism. Um, Do you ever read the Declaration of Independence? Of nature's God? Well, it's because the guy who wrote it was a deist. Like, so we should keep that in mind when we're willing to squabble over things that are in the government instead of fighting for the gospel. We're fighting over a product of humanism. And by the way, today, people have kind of taken that to the next level, which is hedonism, right? It is the unmitigated glorification of your passions. Do what you want. Do what makes you feel good. Romans 1, verses 22-23, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of God, of the immortal God, for images resembling <coughs> mortal man. That's what we become. <coughs> but of course it's what we become. It's what we always have been. Okay, so this wrath that God, uh, that Paul's talking about in Romans, is both a present and an eschatological wrath. Remember, eschatology in times, right? So, um, the word revealed here is actually the word, are you ready? Yeah. Apocalypto. Is in the word? Apocalypse. Apocalypse. Um, it's better translated probably as constantly revealed, is being revealed. In other words, there is a constant revelation today, and of course we understand that, right? That's the phrase, God gave them up. There is a present punishment for sin, a present revealing of wrath for sin, and we see that. But then, of course, there's also a future eschatological, in times punishment for those who don't know Jesus. And that's Paul's message right now, right? He's, he's saying to the people, this is, this is where you are apart from God's righteousness through Jesus Christ. This is where you should be through God's righteousness in Jesus Christ. Romans 2 5 says, But because of your hard and impenitent hearts, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be 
revealed. So there is an end time sense to this as well. And then finally, I want you to think about this. Wrath is revealed from heaven. Um, I didn't use the phrase that one commentator used. Um, I, I couldn't bring myself to do it, but I guess I'll use it now. And he talked about the all-seeing eye of God's judgment. Um, I, uh, I'm not real excited about the phrase um, because of what implications it has outside of the church. Um, but that notion of God's judgment looking into every area of darkness and that judgment coming from on high, coming from heaven. Verse 18b, so that's, that's the first couple of words of 18, so we're making great progress. Uh, 18b, wrath, this wrath will be showed against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. We'll go quickly here. Um, ungodliness is a failure to worship God as God. That's what ungodliness is. It is a failure to worship God as God. See, here's the thing. We're built to worship something. We're built to worship something. And so the reason why we have replaced God with other things is because we're built to worship something. And we have to make a choice. Will we worship God through our faith in Jesus Christ? Or will we worship something else? I would argue that, that, that something else is almost entirely ourselves. That we have replaced God in that as they used to say in the youth ministry programs all the time, in that God-sized hole in our heart. I never liked that phrase because um, there's no real limit to God, right? But, but I get the picture. Ungodliness is a failure to worship God as God. We will always worship something, and this leads to idolatry if we do not worship God the Father. Again, the word worship means to bow down. It is literally to prostrate yourself. I just want you to pause and think about that for a second. Are you prostrating yourself before God in how you're living your life? Worship is not simply singing of songs, right? It's prayer. Um, it's a living sacrifice that we make. Romans 12, um, 1 through 1 through certainly 1 and 2. One to five, really. Um, but but this is this is the idea. We are to be prostrate before God. Man, woe to us if we see God as our chum, our pal, our buddy. And we'll talk about this again in a second. But worship is to prostrate yourself before God. Um, it carries the idea of kissing the earth before God. So ungodliness is a failure to worship God as God. Unrighteousness then is the result of that. John MacArthur says this, Sin first attacks God's majesty and then His law. Men do not act righteously because they are not rightly related to God who is the only measure and source of righteousness. God is the only measure and source of righteousness. Ungodliness unavoidably leads to unrighteousness. Okay, in the chicken versus the egg argument, it's pretty simple in this case. Ungodliness, when you choose not to worship God, that then leads to unrighteousness. Kevin? Yes. You see, the worship is prostration. Mm hmm. Okay. That, just, I want to make sure I got that right. Yep. Yep. So, a wrong relationship with God, and this is an important point, a wrong relationship with God affects all other relationships as well, then, doesn't it? Because we are then marked by that unrighteousness. So, I want to highlight a couple of things. A word of caution. I think we in the church, if it's true here, then we need to try that shoe on. Right? Like, if it fits, we need to wear it. Let me say that again. If it's true here, we need to deal with it. If it's true in your heart, you need to deal with it. If it's true in my heart, I need to deal with it. 
This is really important. I think the church in this country today is in danger of having way too low a view of God. And I just want to roll through some things that this means when you have too low a view of God. See, Scripture teaches a closeness to God. Right? Can we be, can we be sure of that? Uh, Galatians 4, 6, God is called Abba. The word means what? Father, but it's really like dear Father. Like Caitlin, Caitlin when, she, um, when she really wants something from me, she'll say, Papa. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, like, that's that term of endearment that we see in Galatians. Uh, 1 John 3, 1, um, we're given, God gives us the ability to be called children of God. There's a closeness through Jesus Christ that we have with God. Yes? But, when you look at Moses, Isaiah, and John, Exodus 33, when Moses asked to see God's face. Isaiah, when he comes into the Holy of Holies. John, when he's ushered into the Holy of Holies, they reveal a very high view of God. Now, I want to... Yeah, yeah I just have a question. You know all the Psalms that when they say, seek God's face first. Mm -hmm. Did it mean His presence before His provision? It's a good question. I don't know. It makes sense. I mean, yeah. obviously we're not going to see him, but it seems like it's be present to him, seek his presence before I start asking for all the things I need more. Yeah, I, I mean, I, that makes sense to me. I, I have to probably sit yeah. and think well, about it. Just stir it but up. yeah. Stir it um, see, and I want to be cautious here too. I think a, a high church tradition. In other words, what we see in the Presbyterian, kind of the high, that high church mentality, can lead to a view of God as a distant judge. That's not the God of the Bible. Right? The God of the Bible, particularly for those who have a relationship with Him through Jesus Christ, is not a distant judge. That, that is by no means the God of the Bible. So we have to be cautious of that. But I would argue that today there's a tendency to view God as your pal. I've actually heard people start prayers like this. Hey, pal. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've heard it a lot. Hey, man. I just want you to just pause for a second and think about the great detriment we, we are, the great detriment we have enjoyed if if this is where we are, that we would dare call God man. By the way, I'm not joking. People do this. See, what we've done, and I'm afraid we've done this in our worship, in, in the songs that we sing, we've drawn God to our level. That's a dangerous place to be. It's one thing to be drawn to God's level, right? When, when God, through Jesus Christ, gives us salvation, the mind of Christ. But to pull God down, which is overwhelmingly, when you turn on um, the modern praise song, what you hear. And people will say, well, do we make a big deal out of this or not? There's a lot of people who would say, nah, well, that's... Man, it's just people who love Jesus. Well, okay. Maybe that's true. Maybe they're at a state where they, you know, they, they haven't spiritually matured yet. I think that can be true too. And we need to understand people are at different levels and all of that. But man, I would hate to be before God and having to answer for leading a, a people in a worship of Him that draws Him to our love. That's dangerous. Too low a view, uh, too low a view of God, causes too high a view of man. Too low a view of God causes too high a view of man, and this leads to all types of heresies. The Arminian heresy, and by the way, Arminianism is absolute heresy. Now. Can you define that again? Yeah, yeah. Let me let me hit this. What what is that? 
so I'll, I'll hit it right now. So Arminianism, this idea that, that we alone are involved in our relationship with God. It's not true. It's not biblical. Now, there are many people who have some of the Arminian traits. Okay? Does that make sense? So, for example, we have many brothers who believe um, that you choose God. And by the way, you can, you can choose not to choose God. But you can give up your salvation through sin. Uh, in fact, um, uh, there are whole denominations that, um, that they will seek a, a new relationship with Jesus on a daily basis. Well, that's not the God of the Bible. Right? We, we say it today. He will hold me fast. God didn't send His Son to be this great sacrifice for us for it to be a trivial pursuit. So when we look at the full tenets, the full tenets of the Arminian doctrine, not good. Heresy may be a little strong. Having said that, having said that, there are a lot of people, and we have taught this in our culture, overwhelmingly, this idea that, that uh, we just got to say this prayer. Think about how many people have, um, have at camps all over the country, I used to counsel a, a big one in California, Hume Lake. No one here ever heard of Hume Lake? Yeah. Have you really, Nancy? <coughs> Were you really? Wow, Hume Lake is this huge Christian camp in California that that uh, Hume Lake yeah huge Christian camp like all those Californians went to but, um, but but man it's say the prayer just say the prayer it's your fire insurance policy just sign on the dotted line that's not the God of scripture cheap grace. What, what, what was it, it cheap is it's cheap grace what was the prayer they wanted to, but I mean just your very typical prayer God I'm a sinner um, I believe Jesus died for me. And by the way, I'm not saying that the prayer itself is wrong. Okay, let me be very clear about that. But, but there's a reason why Jesus says, consider the cost. Right? It's, and so we need to remember this. There was a guy named Zane Hodges who uh, uh, wrote a book. I can't remember the name of the book. But in his book, he said that you could have no change in your life at all. Once you said the prayer, you were secured. Yeah. I mean, that's just not the, the God of the Bible. That's not the call for Christians. You know, Kevin, just a thought on that. Um, I think that the last chapter of the book of John crystallizes the issue when he says, yeah. follow me. Yeah. And, and the question for myself and for brothers and sisters here and those who are inquiring and stuff, it might be the question, who are you following? Yeah, amen, Gary. That's exactly right. Well, and I want to make the point now, again, uh, there are people who say that prayer. There are people who went to Hume Lake and, and were a part of some of that stuff who clearly became a Christian. Okay? I'm one of them. That's not the point that I'm making. The point that I'm making is when we cheapen the grace, we we give people sometimes a false sense of security. Like just because you got a fire insurance policy doesn't mean that your house doesn't burn down. Right? And so I think it's important that we remember that. I just want to interject one little thing and then I'll let you go on. Um, when people, like today is, person who came up and accepted Jesus today. We don't want to forget him. No. And we don't want to just say, oh, that was great, and forget that he did that. And yeah, pat ourselves on the back and call it good. He needs to be nurtured. Mm -hmm. to be Disciple. Disciple. Him. Yep. Yep. Discipleship. Yeah. Pastor Ken used to teach us yep. class. For and that's what we're called to do, right? We're called to make disciples. Uh, and that's a really important phrase. I would, I would ask you, who are you discipling? If you don't know the answer to that question, that's a problem. Everybody in here should be discipling somebody. 
Let me say that again. If you don't know who you're discipling, that's a problem. Now, some of you are discipling your kids, right? I mean, so there's, there's a lot of discipleship areas and avenues, but I think it's a good thing for you to ask yourself, who am I discipling? Okay, I'm going to finish this thought up. By the way, um, uh, Heidi, how do you say their last name? Pile. Pile. We had this discussion in prayer this morning. The piles will be in here for a luncheon afterwards, right, Heidi? Um, and it's a luncheon. Yeah. Light food, I'm guessing. Uh, but they would love for you to stay and get to know the piles and have some of that time with them. That's why I'm trying to hurry through this here. Um, so... Too low, view, too low of a view of God causes too high a view of man leads to all types of heresies. Too low a view of God, like Adam and Eve, elevates our view of ourselves and leads to pride. Right? That's ultimately the sin of Adam and Eve. They wanted to be like God. They're elevating themselves. Too low a view of God diminishes the work of Christ on the cross. Too low a view of God diminishes the work of Christ on the God on the cross. And too low a view of God numbs our senses for our need for that work of Christ on the cross. It numbs our senses. If, if God is not as big as the God of Scripture, then we look at what Christ did on the cross and we think, man, you know, that's cool. I said my prayer. You know, I go to church every now and then. I pray sometimes. Like, like if the police officer just pulled me over, I pray sometimes then. My daughter <laughs> prays before tests. Right? Like, I mean, I'm a, I'm a Christian. See, too low a view of God numbs our senses for our need for the work that Christ accomplished on the cross. And if we indeed have that low view of God, and I think this is the metric. Let me say this again. This is the barometer. This will tell you where your view of God is. Let me say that again. What I'm about to say, I think, will tell you where your view of God is. If we do indeed have a low view of God, then this impacts all of our relationships as well. For why should we share the gospel? Why should we share the gospel? Why live a life of faithfulness? A high view of God demands that we share the gospel because God has demanded that we share the gospel. A high view of God demands that we live a life of faithfulness because the God of the Bible has, has demanded that we live a life of faithfulness. That is the measuring stick for how high your view of God is. If you're not discipling, if you're not training others in righteousness, if you're not pursuing the path of righteousness, recognizing that we still live in the flesh, of course, right? If we're not sharing the gospel, that tells you where your view of God is. It's way too low. Why? Because God, the God of the Bible, Thrice holy has called us to do those things. And if we can't make time, if we can't overcome our feelings and our insecurities, then that shows you that we have placed that as highly as we have placed God in our life. <coughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, this, this is uh, such a this is an intense passage, no doubt. Whenever we talk about the wrath that you have for sin, God, that's intense. Father, I pray that you would use that to first convict our hearts that we would pursue you in faithfulness. God, that we would put sin to death. That we would seek after you with our full heart. Knowing, of course, God, that we are going to continue to sin and that we need to continually come to you confessionally and repent of our sins. God, help us to keep that balance as well. 
Father, help us also as a response to the to a high view of you. Father, help us to be sharing the gospel as we recognize that first you have called us to it. And second, that we don't deserve it. And it is only through your grace that we have the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you so much for everyone here today. Um, God, I thank you uh, that we have so many people in our church who are dedicated to getting to know you better, to walk with you closer. Father, I pray for this next time here in this room. God, that it would be um, both refreshing and challenging as um, those that are here hear from missionaries to others of your people that you've created. God, I thank you for salvation today. God, thank you. Thank you that you love us that much that you sent Jesus for us. God, help us to respond in the way that you call us to. It's in your son's name we pray.